This is uh, one of those passages that um, you, uh, when you read it, you, it's like, oh yes, I just can't wait to preach this, this sermon. You know, I just can't wait to, to preach this. And, uh, and yet, uh, we realize that it's part of the Scriptures, it's part of the parables that Jesus was talking about. And in chapter 25, and continuing on, but in 25, He's given several parables. And we talked last time about the parable of the, uh, the ten bridesmaids, the five wise and the five foolish. And one of the things that stood out in that passage was that the uh, person, the bride that was to come, was tarrying. It, it was a long time. And even in this passage we see that it's a long time before the Master returns. Another indication to us that in the kingdom, it, there's patience required. That things don't always happen when we think they should and how we think they should. But here we have this story, as was uh, mentioned and read, about the talents. And uh, I think this, this is one of those passages that's been misapplied, misinterpreted. Uh, even when you read commentaries and stuff, it's, it's a little hard to, uh, to get to what is the meaning of, of all this? Now, first of all, what is a talent? And uh, our English word talent is the idea of that our skills and abilities. But in this, the, the Greek word for talents here is really money. And it's a lot of money. A talent was, uh, some commentators said, 15 years of wages. So just take 15 years of, of wages without spending it and put it into a bank, and that's one talent. A lot of money. A lot of money. And when this fellow uh, gave those uh, servants all this money, uh, each one was given something different. You know, uh, five talents, two talents, one talent. And the idea there, you know, is that we're not all given the same thing. I don't understand. I don't know why. But we're not always born. We know that. We're not all born good looking. We're not all born with a lot of money, with a silver spoon in our mouth. And some of us are born with better opportunities in better places than others. And that's the way life is. But what we do with it is what matters. A lot of people will say, well, I was born this way. I was born this color. I was born this, this type of person. I was born this type of, in, in, in America. I was born in Eastern Kentucky. I was born in this family. I was, so I don't have a chance. That is not at all what God is saying. In fact, God is saying just the opposite. God is saying that each and every one of us are giving a measure of something. And each and every one of us are required to do something with that. Now, in understanding this passage, and I, I really uh, struggled with this, I, I have to tell you. But uh, one of the things that I, I remember in Bible college, uh, we took a class called hermeneutics, which is a study of, of the Scriptures and how, how to interpret Scripture. Bible study, really. Methods is what it is about. And I remember one of the things, one of the laws, or one of the rules, which was known as Cooper's, David Cooper's rules, was when the plain sense of Scripture makes good sense, seek no other sense. In other words, <coughs> don't try to make it mean something that it doesn't, if it's obvious <coughs> what it means. However, there are those passages of Scripture that are harder to understand, and they may be obscure, and they may not uh, on their own make a lot of sense. And we have to be careful that we don't make a doctrine out of an obscure passage. That's what a lot of the cults do. They take one little verse and, and make a doctrine out of it. So another rule of interpretation is this, that whenever, wherever there is an obscure passage, hard to understand passage. Always interpret obscure passages in light of clearer passages. 
So, if you get to a passage that seems to contradict the rest of the Bible, understand that that's probably not the correct interpretation. Just start from there. Say, well, this, this can't be right because the rest of the Bible says otherwise. Therefore, you interpret that passage based upon a whole bunch of Scripture. So, you interpret Scripture with Scripture. You can't take one verse and say, well, this is what it says, and therefore it's what it means. No, you have to do the proper interpretation. And so, the proper hermeneutical principle would be to look at the whole of the story. And that's where we get in trouble sometimes. We read something and we jump on it and say, that's what it means. But then we read over here, Jesus says something else completely contradicts that. And here's a passage like that. Here's a passage that a lot of people have preached to mean that if you don't do enough, if, you're, if you come up short, then you're not going to make the grade. That you're not going to make it to heaven. And if that's what this passage is teaching us, then I'm afraid it really contradicts the rest of what Jesus says. If that's what this passage is teaching us, it contradicts us almost everything the Apostle Paul says about grace and about salvation and eternal life being a gift. If it really is saying to us that if we're not doing enough, that we're not going to make it to heaven, we're all in big trouble today. Let's just start right there, including myself. I think there's something more going on here. If you compare it with the other parables, and you compare it with the other scriptures, I think there's a little more to it, and there's a point here that needs to be made. Remember, a parable is simply, and this is a parable because Jesus says it is as if. It's, it's not a true story. It's, it's, a, it's a, an allegory. And as in the other parable, we see two things at play here. And that we see is grace and judgment. We see the generosity of God, and we see judgment. So, which one is true? Well, they're both true. They're both true at the same time. However, we have a tendency to focus on one or the other. I grew up in a, in a, in a circle of, of churches that focused only on the judgment. And every Sunday uh, that was preached, it was about going to hell. Every Sunday, every Sunday. And so, I grew up thinking that God was this kind of a mean person up there who wanted to send people to hell. I didn't know that, you know, that was in the back of my mind. I'm glad Sandy sung that song today. Because it says exactly what I want to say today. And that is this. That God is a generous God. And He goes out of His way to bring us into a relationship with Him. He gave His life on Calvary to have a relationship with us. And if we refuse, and He can't force us to have a relationship with us, but He will do everything in His power to bring us to Him. Can we all agree on that at least? Amen? I see some of you shaking your heads. We, amen. We'll all, let's just agree that God is a loving God. But yes, as in the last sermon, there is an element of judgment to this. And as I said, God doesn't force His love on anyone. It's always available. He's always standing there with arms wide open. But He can't force it. And so, in this passage, uh, really you have this uh, picture here of someone who is kind of uh, uh, talking about really investing. And so, I think you know, these talents could be basically just about anything. When we become a member of the Methodist Church of here at Salem, we ask people, generally speaking, do you promise or, or will you say that you're going to support this church with your time, your treasure, and your talents, basically? That's what we ask. So that by becoming a member, you are making a promise, really, a vow. Just kind of like when you get married, you're making a vow. That I'm going, you know, I'm going to support you. I'm going to love you. Well, when you become a church member, you're saying I'm going to come alongside this church and I'm going to put my energy into it. I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can. Now, we all have lives and jobs and families, so we can't be here 24 hours a day. But we all agree to do that. Not all do, but that's what 
That's what we say. And really, I think that's what this is about. The fact that we've all been given some responsibility and some abilities to use for the kingdom. This is about the kingdom. To use for the kingdom of God. And it's up to us to do that. Uh, and so, I, I tend to focus on the joy because you'll notice that over and over again, the Bible talks about in, in, in this passage, these, these fellows that invested, you have the, the five talent guy, the two talent guy, and both times, you know, Jesus is saying, enter into the joys of the Lord. Welcome. And, and I'm going to make you ruler over many things. And so, uh, production is definitely a part of this. But I want to I tell you what I think that this is passage is really, really saying today. Two things at least, maybe more. But first of all, I think this parable teaches us that God knows our hearts. I think if you read this passage you understand that God really knows this person. And He knows our hearts. The warning and the encouragement is this. Don't see Jesus the way this servant saw Jesus. This is not a story of a Christian who came up short on Judgment Day. This is not a story about someone whose works and good deeds were weighed with his bad deeds and he come up short. This is about a, a story about a person whose heart was not right in the first place. And I'll show you that. First of all, we see in this passage that he has no kingdom interest at all. He has no interest in the things of his master. And when you get right down to it, he's really, he's really a thief. He's a Judas. Because each one of these people were given money, but it wasn't their money. It wasn't theirs it was the master's money. And each one had a responsibility to do with it what they were supposed to do, which was invest. <coughs> and so, as they take this, they, uh, the, the first two do just that. They invest. But the other guy, the one talent guy, <coughs> takes the money, and what does he do with it? He hides it. I think I have a water right here. Thank you. And instead of investing, he hides it in, he digs a hole and buries it in the ground. Now, that may seem crazy, but that was what a lot of people did in those days. They, they would bury their money. <clears throat> that was kind of their bank, a lot of them. So, which was, that was no big surprise, except for this. That wasn't his money. Which shows that he had no intention of ever giving the money back. The truth of the matter is, <clears throat> God saw him for what he really was, a scoundrel. And he was going to take this money, and rather than investing it and <clears throat> getting more from it, he was going to hide it, hoping that someday he could spend it for himself. That's what I think is really going on here. Otherwise, he would not have buried the money. Now, he comes up with a story about seeing uh, the person here who represents Jesus as this master who's... <clears throat> really harsh. But he doesn't seem the right way. Because the other guys, you know, they didn't have the same amount. And the problem is, you know, we, we don't all have the same abilities, the same uh, amount of whatever it is that we have, talents. You know, but we all have something. So he has no kingdom interest at all. I think of people like Jim Baker who have really been a, a, a bad name and a bad, given the church a bad rap. You think of a person like Jim Baker who back in the 80s and 90s uh, took uh, this PTL club and, and made it a billionaire's club really. And they come up with this uh, place of Heritage USA and build it up as, and decided to have a Christian theme park and all that. <clears throat> and he took billions and billions of dollars and we know what happened. 
Uh, he built this great big uh, high rise that was supposed to be for people to have a lifetime. If they gave a thousand dollars, they could stay in this and have a place for the rest of their life. But we know that he took more money than more than they had rooms to pay for, and so he went to prison for fraud, committed adultery, and all kinds of things. While he was in prison, he wrote a book. And it was called I Was Wrong. I read that book, a big book, and I really thought, you know what? Here's a guy who, who messed up, and he's found his way. And I really thought, you know, here's a guy who's, you know, we got to give him some grace. But after looking at the rest of his life, he hasn't really proven that he understands that he did wrong. Because he's doing the same thing today that he was doing back then, in my opinion. You know, now he's selling kits uh, for <laughs> oh, we get another ghost. Well, now he's selling kits for uh, doomsday, or he's a doomsday prophet type thing, selling selling things. And so, in my opinion, I don't see that it's changed that much. In other words, I feel like some of these people have taken what God has given them from people of God and have wasted it and squandered it on their own selves. We see it all the time. Not just in the Christian realm, but investors who, who take people's money and squander it on their own jets and on their own stuff and clothes and, and putting their kids in college and all kinds of stuff. And that's a waste, by the way. And see, the, the thing is, God knows our hearts. God knows who we are, and I think He knows our hearts. So we see this guy had no interest, interest in the kingdom. And secondly, he doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't really know him. He describes a person that he doesn't know. And if you understand the parable before, the parable of the bridesmaids, when they come at the, at the end there, the judgment, they, the, they say, I never knew you. Jesus will say to this person, I never knew you. In other words, you're not a person who, who started and failed. You are a person I never knew. And here's the thing about God. In the Bible, you see that Jesus never treated the sinners badly, as we would sometimes. He never treated them with contempt. And He never treated them with condemnation. He always approached them with loving grace. Always. It was the people who pretended to be one thing and were another. It were the hypocrites, the Pharisees, who uh, really took advantage of the poor and took advantage of other people and put all these rules and restrictions on people and they themselves wouldn't follow them. Those are the people that Jesus got angry with. Not the woman who was committing adultery. Not the people who were uh, caught in acts that were wrong. Now, I'm not saying that these are okay. What I'm saying is that He is not here to uh, condemn anyone. The Bible says there is there no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The thing that this is, is that God knows our hearts today. And someday we'll stand before God and our hearts will be revealed. And this parable teaches us just that. The third thing about this is that uh, this person is cast into outer darkness, which shows us their heart. You see, God doesn't cast people into outer darkness who are Christians, whose heart is in the right place. And I don't know much about the afterlife. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot, whole lot about heaven or hell or any of those things. But the point is that there is judgment. And that we won't all be in the same place and enjoying the same realities someday. But this is not about a person who, who didn't measure up. Let's just put that aside. This is about a person who knew what they were doing and did the wrong thing anyway. It's a, it's a story really about humanity and it's about judgment and grace. The second thing this parable teaches us is it teaches us what life is all about. It really does. It's what we're created to be and to do. We've all been given a purpose in this life. And we're all standing given account for what we did with that. But God created us with a desire and the ability to be productive, to do something. And as I said, we don't all have the same gifts. We don't have the same abilities. We don't have the same energy. We don't have the same health, all that. 
Life is a fair sometimes. But God's not going to judge you based upon your how much you have. He's going to judge you based on what you did with what you have. You may be one of those, as Sandy said, you may feel like, well, I, I just can't measure up. Therefore, I'm just not going to try, as this man seemed to say. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not about that. It's not about that because God looks at the heart. And He wants us to live for Him. Yes, we're not equally talented. But if we are faithful in what God has given us, we can equally please the Lord. Most of us have children. And if we have more than one, grandkids, whatever, or if we're a teacher, we understand they're all different. They're all different. And some of them have different talents, and some of them have different skills and abilities. But that doesn't mean we don't love them. We do. I have two dogs that are completely different. You know, Toby is this wonderful dog that does everything, you, you know, anything you'd want in a dog, that's Toby, the black lab. The other dog is so much different. He is a wild child. I mean, he doesn't do anything. And when you let him outside, he takes off uh, like crazy in the woods or whatever, and you can't find him. He just drives me crazy sometimes. But I love them both. Do you think God is any different? It's, I believe God loves us all, but the truth of the matter is, life is all about doing and being what we're created to be. And it all comes down to this. It's about the kingdom. It's about people. It's about how we love and how we treat people. And I'm not saying it's about works. Don't, don't get that. What, it's, what I'm saying is this, that how we do and what we do reveals what's in our heart. Jesus said what comes out of the mouth comes first from where? The heart. We just had an election, and so I, I think I can, I can say this. But, you know, we've heard a lot of talk in the last several years, really, about... Uh, how we should uh, treat one another. And regardless of what you think about uh, President Trump, you know, I, I think some of his policies worked and, you know, the economy and all that. But at the same time, some of the things that he said, the way he said things, the way he belittles people, that has been a source of irritation for a lot of people. But understand that the, the, uh, both sides are doing it. You know, we, we, the very thing that we condemn President Trump for doing, you know, we go out and we, we, we burn down uh, buildings and say, I don't believe that we should be treating people inhumanely, and yet here we are burning somebody's business. Now tell me, does that make sense? All I'm saying is this, that our heart will reveal our actions. Our heart and our words reveal what's in our heart. And it doesn't matter what party you belong to. You don't get a pass at doing the right thing and being good to your neighbor because you don't agree with what they're doing. You don't get a pass and say, I can, I can hurt somebody because I don't agree with what they're doing. Because they're wrong. And they may be wrong. But two wrongs don't make a right. You see... This is saying that we as Christians are called to be different. We're, we're given a higher responsibility. And what we do with other people reveals what's in our hearts. You know what it scares me today is what I see in people's hearts and what's coming out of people's hearts is very, very, very ugly. Because we all... We all, you know, there was a time in this country where we cared about the country, and, and even though we didn't agree with it, we still loved one another, and we still loved the country. And that's no longer the case. I agree there's things that need to change, for sure. But at the same time, that doesn't give us a pass to treat other people inhumanely. I don't care what party you belong to. It, it's never wrong. I mean, it's never right to do wrong. And so, this is really about what, what life is all about. I think about a lady who was 38 years old. 
sitting in a movie theater one night and looks up on the screen and sees these beautiful actors and she says, oh, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could sing like that. I wish I was that beautiful. I wish I could be like that person. But they realized they couldn't be. And then one day she read a book that changed her life. And she began to remember that back in school that she had this ability to make people laugh. She thought, you know, maybe I could do that. And this person would go on to make a career out of making people laugh. Phyllis Diller. And for those of us who remember her, we understand she wasn't the prettiest woman around, right? But yet she had what she had, and she used what she had to do something good. Each and every one of us are given different things, different abilities, different talents to invest. What are you doing with what God's given you? What are you doing with that? Let's pray as they come. Dear Father, you know that we all come short. We realize, Father, that that this life is all we have. Time is running out. And God, we can get caught up in the political race. We can get caught up in the rhetoric of others. But God, you called us to something much higher than that. We're working for the kingdom. Lord, the king is coming. Let us put aside these these rags of, uh, Lord, self-righteousness, injustice, and hatred, and bitterness. And let us be real, Lord. And let us pick up the mantle and run the race that you've called us to run. To the best of our ability, with what you have given us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can't wait to hear him say, enter in into the joy of the Lord. Each and every one of us today have that possibility. It's ours for the choosing, the accepting. All right. The benediction, go out among the outcasts and the grieving and speak the word of life and hope. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.